and welcome back to our fourth installment in the Parkinson's Disease Innovations Week. We really appreciate all the participation and it's been really fantastic so far. As you know, I'm James Brewer. I'm the chair of the Department of Neurosciences and I'm very proud to uh, be the home department of this fantastic center. But as you'll see, this center spans many departments across the campus. And we're gonna highlight that today as we talk about some of the really innovative cell biology techniques and imaging approaches that are being used to address Parkinson's disease. Today's topic is 4D biology and cell dynamics, paving the way for personalized medicine. I think you're really gonna enjoy uh, the talks today. Just a little background about our Department of Neurosciences. As I've mentioned, we are a special department that houses not only uh, groundbreaking neurosciences work, but also the clinical neurology uh, that takes place at UC San Diego. So that special environment is, is why we call it the Department of Neurosciences and not just the Department of Neurology. That amalgamation of top neurosciences research with top clinicians has led us to be the number one NIH funded neurosciences department in the nation. So in fact, this co-localization of science and medicine has really proven to be a very effective combination for advancing forward disease, disease therapies across many neurological illnesses. Today, we're focusing on Parkinson's disease, but as I've mentioned in the past sessions, we've really innovated work in our Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, neuromuscular illnesses such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, headache, uh, the whole spectrum of from the brain to the muscles uh, has been really addressed through this special uh, collection of scientists and physicians that we have within the UC San Diego Department of Neurosciences. And today we're going to talk about 4D biology and cell dynamics, paving the way for personalized medicine. And to do that, we've invited really some of the top scientists in this uh, university. Um, very delighted to welcome our uh, good friend and longtime collaborator, Susan Taylor, who's the Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry and also Distinguished Professor of Pharmacology. She is a world expert in protein kinase A uh, and was instrumental in solving the crystal structure, the protein structure of the first protein kinase, providing a template for this entire family of regulatory enzymes. She's a founding member of the UC San Diego community, has been instrumental in recruiting and nurturing new talent, as well as fostering interdisciplinary collaborations across the campus. And I'll note, she runs an amazing program called the Research Council, where we bring together individuals from across the entire campus. And it is such a robust, innovative discussion that it's just, it, it's like manna from heaven for scientists. And I've, I've described this place as a neurosciences playground. It really is a translational uh, medicine playground for so many different specialties. So Susan, we're gonna welcome her and she's gonna kick off the talks. Alexandra Newton is Distinguished Professor of Pharmacology and the Director of Cell Signaling at UC San Diego. And this was a, a cell signaling center that was newly created in 2020 to bring together the outstanding talent in San Diego to better understand cell signaling mechanisms. Uh, Dr. Newton is an expert in understanding the structure, function, and regula regulation of a key signaling molecule in cells, protein kinase C, which you'll hear more about, and how its function is altered in disease. Her research provides the necessary biochemical understanding to drive effective therapeutic strategies. So Dr. Newton will bring us a great amount of enlightenment about protein kinase C. And finally, a junior new recruit to our environment, which all of us are absolutely enthusiastic about, Johannes Schoenberg, who joins us from UC Berkeley. He's an assistant professor at pharmacology, chemistry, and biology. He recently completed his postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley, where he was also a fellow at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and a Siebel fellow of the Berkeley Stem Cell Center. He brings and he's going to show it to you. It's a really remarkable imaging technique that really rare in the entire world. I think this would be the third uh, installment of, a, of an incredible program of uh, 
of imaging that he brings right to our Center for Neural Circuits and Behavior, where he will be linking up with some of the other scientists that you've heard about, as we talked about yesterday, we're making a real push to carry on the legacy of Roger Chen, the Nobel laureate, who uh, really led so much of the, um, of the imaging science at UC San Diego for so many years. This is part of our special approach to uh, bring the latest in engineering and imaging techniques to bear on diseases of the nervous system. And so his 4D adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscopy is really one of only a few in the world and will help us have unprecedented insights into cell dynamics that will inform new approaches to therapeutics. So today's talk is going to be absolutely delightful. And to tell you a little bit more, I'm going to introduce the director of the Center for Parkinson's Disease and Other Movement Disorders, Irene Litvan. Irene? Hi, good morning. So glad to be here, the fourth day of phenomenal, phenomenal talks. This is incredibly exciting, and I'm so glad that this program has, put, uh, has been put forward. So today, Dr. Taylor and her team will highlight their innovative work. She will discuss her work with protein kinases and will explain how the molecules move in the cell to communicate their messages through a cascade of events that lead to the enzymes to perform a function. For example, phosphorylation. When the codes of communications are off, there is a possibility that a disease develops. This excellent team, uh, Dr. Nudon in particular, will discuss the specific enzymes that they work on that are called uh, kinases, and in particular, we refer to those that are associated with Parkinson's and will give us an example of how the problems occur in the cellular communication in Parkinson's disease that results in the malfunction of the cells. Dr. Taylor's great track record of recruiting talent, as uh, Dr. Ruer said, um, has led to the re recruitment of Dr. Johannes Schoenberg who is an extremely good example of that. He will discuss how one visualizes the cell dynamics in his 4D biology microscope. This advanced imaging allows us to look at cells activity in vivo, in real time. It is an unprecedented window into the disease dynamics, how the disease progresses. He and his team have an expertise in cells and they are developing these new brain models called brain organoids. These are like mini brains. And this is an exciting new technology that has the potential to significantly change our understanding of the development of the brain and of disorders of the human brain, such as Parkinson's disease. The culture of uh, pluripotent stem cells allows to recapitulate the various stages of the human brain development in vitro. And recent studies shown that brain organoids can mimic how the neurons form, the formation of a regional neural circuitry and the integration of cells that support the neurons that are called glial cells into neural networks. What are neural networks? They are like the various circuits of a car. And examples of brain uh, circuits uh, are the motor circuit, the memory circuit. The brain organoids could serve as a representative model system to study the Parkinson's brain and the use of the advanced imaging techniques such as the 4D imaging with adaptive optics microscopy could help develop new therapeutic approaches for a person with Parkinson's disease. All this seems like science fiction. So today you are in for another treat. Jean, let's uh, uh, go back to you and uh, continue. Thank you, Drs. Taylor, Newton, and Schoenberg. Take it away. 
I will start off and I it's my real pleasure to introduce myself and my team to you today. And thank you, Jim, for that really kind introduction. Um, I am, came here, my husband Palmer and I came here in the early 1970s. UCSD was less than 10 years old then. We bought a house in Del Mar and we've spent our whole careers here, not only developing our careers, but also building this to be one of the top uh, research institutions in the entire world. It's just incredible what has happened here on the Mesa. The hallmark of UCSD, I think, as Jim alluded to, is, is this um, uh, collaborative environment. So we have engineering, medicine, everything on the same Mesa here. So it's really extraordinary. And all of us collaborate. It's something that distinguishes us. So um, I my expertise is with protein kinases, and I'm one of the eminent scientists on this campus. I, my career has flourished here. Um, kinases turn things on and off in the cell. You'll, you'll appreciate that. My expertise is with a, a protein called PKA. And you, you all know PKA because anytime, you know, fight or flight front response, adrenaline goes into your bloodstream. And what does it do? It binds to the outside of a cell, a muscle cell, and it turns on this cyclic AMP inside and you get energy. Um, it's like your whole caffeine. Caffeine elevates your cyclic AMP. So my little kinase is turning things on in all kinds of cells and doing all different kinds of things. You heard about LARC2 yesterday from Sam and her team. And LARC2 is one of the biggest and most complex protein kinases. And yet, you know now that one changing one residue out of 2,500 residues makes it a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And we want to understand how that happens. So kinases are, are critical switches. Um, so in addition to um, uh, my own career, so I've been a passionate advocate for UCSD and recruiting the best talent to come here uh, and then making sure that that talent has access to all the incredible resources that we have. So uh, Roger Chen is, is one of probably next to my own career contributions to UCSD. Recruiting Roger Chen to come here in 1989 was probably one of the most important things I've done for UCSD. And Roger is sort of a, a model for all of us. Roger used chemistry to really capture conversations that are taking place in the cell with fluorescent probes. And he did all his Nobel Prize work here at UCSD. Um, and he opened up the inside of the cell to, to all of us um, and, and to the whole world. So it was really a revolution being able to ask questions of an individual cell. So Roger was an incredible pioneer. Um, and so um, what I'm hoping to, to convey to you now is this um, revolution that Roger catalyzed and now introduce you to the next revolution in biology. I see it, the 4D biology. And I think by the end, you'll appreciate that as well. And so my other thing that I'm, I'm good at is building teams. And the LARC2 team that you heard yesterday, um, you know, five years ago, they, didn't, they hadn't done anything with LARC2, nor had I. Um, but it was a kinase, and I know a lot about kinases. And so I put together a proposal for the Michael J. Fox Foundation saying, we can really understand the structure and function of this kinase if we put together a team. So they have the cryo-EM technology, the cryo-electron tom tomography that Elizabeth has. Um, I know my knowledge of kinases. And together, we not only showed how the kinase domain is driving the dynamics of this whole protein, but also we got these structures. This is quite remarkable that in four years, pharmaceutical companies have been trying to do this for the last decade and had not made any progress. We had two structures, Andreas's structure, which is a static structure, um, and Elizabeth's, which is wrapped around microtubules in, this, in cells. It's very amazing. So now what I really want to do is to really go this next step. What is this next revolution? How do we build this next team? And so Alexandra and Johannes will articulate this, but um, um, Alexandra is a, a leader of this signaling community. Signaling is these kinases putting phosphates on and off. And we have one of the most remarkable communities in the world on this Mesa, and she's consolidating that so we can leverage all our expertise to benefit each other and here to understand LARC2. And Johannes, he just started last July, um, and he is really going to catalyze this next revolution of uh, 4D biology. So I will go from here and turn it over to, I think, Alexandra. Right. So hello, everybody. Uh, so I came here uh, 25 years ago because of Susan. So one of the things you've heard about this recurring theme is how she catalyzes all these groups and, and builds and has done 
tremendous things for our university. So I, I'm one of those examples of the people she recruited. So I actually began my career as a professor in the chemistry department in the Midwest. And right after I got there as a beginning uh, assistant professor, 30 years old, I was uh, invited to organize a symposium. And so I brought cell signaling to Bloomington, Indiana. I uh, got all the world experts on cell signaling and my keynote speaker was Susan Taylor. So not even in my wildest dreams back then would I have thought that three decades, decades later, I would have spent most of my career at UCSD and in fact that I'd be building a cell signaling uh, center here. So that, that's how unpredictable life is. Anyhow, flashing back to 30 years ago, one of Susan's gifts is how she looks out for young people and helps promote their careers. And she did exactly that to me. Um, after I met her, she gave me opportunities. Uh, she invited me to give talks at meetings, to organize symposia. And a few years later, she and her husband, Palmer Taylor, recruited me to UCSD. So I, I've been here, like I said, uh, just over 25 years ago. Well, overnight, I went from literally the cornfields to the, the candy store. And my science has just blossomed here. And one of the biggest things in the candy store was a wonderful collaboration with Roger Chen. So next to my uh, picture, you'll see a bunch of cells flashing different colors. So one of the things that uh, Roger has done, and he got the Nobel Prize for this, is make molecules to allow us to visualize what is happening inside cells. He's given us the ability to spy on cells, talk to them, stimulate them, and have them talk back to us. And what you're looking at in these flashing colors are cells that have been treated with histamine. And for any of you who suffer from allergies, maybe you take antihistamine medications, histamines cause calcium in cells to oscillate in the manner that you see there. That's what we're looking at, calcium oscillations in response to being treated with histamine. But he has developed all these different reporters that allow us to look at many different types of molecules, including protein kinases that I will tell you a little bit more about later. So anyhow, Susan recruited me here. It's been fantastic. And I would now like to turn this over to uh, Johannes because he is the latest person that she has brought to UCSD. Johannes. Um, my name is Johannes Schöneberg. And it's true, I'm the latest recruit um, to that team. And I'm extremely excited to be here, to, to be in this team and to be here today because I think we really are going to see a revolution in the way we can uh, explore cells. So when you when you look at the cells that are flashing next to Alexandra uh, over there, then this is essentially a two-dimensional uh, representation of cells. But cells are actually three-dimensional as, as we are. We are three-dimensional beings that live through time. So um, in order to actually see what's going on on a molecular level, what you would like to have is actually a three like three-dimensional movies. However, the, the problem with that is we didn't really have the technology to really create these four dimensional movies until very, very recently. And in the lab of Eric Betzig, um, a new technology has been developed that's called an adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscope. Um, and I'm, I'm literally building that microscope right now in my lab, literally behind this wall. And with this microscope, we can essentially take three-dimensional movies of neurons in brain organoid model systems to um, see what's going on and what's going wrong in Parkinson's disease. And the reason I'm so excited about this and so excited to be here today is in order to make this work and in order to really implement a new paradigm-changing drug discovery strategy for Parkinson's disease, we need you know, we, we, we need to understand the molecular details, um, how kinases operate, for example, where, where Susan is a world expert. We need, you know, um, world experts in cell signaling, how these molecular changes propagate um, through cellular outcomes. And then we, I can essentially come in and build on the work of, of Roger Chen, who developed GFP to actually, you know, make cells light up. And then I can take that technology and uh, like a couple of years later, now we have like the ability to build microscopes that fully utilize that technology to essentially close the circle and um, 
and and apply it to further human health here at UCSD. And you know, we have the clinic right here on campus. Um, we have the San Diego Supercomputing Center here on campus. I'm going to talk about that later. It's going to uh, require a lot of computation um, to, to make this happen. We have the um, cell signaling center here in San Diego. We have this fantastic team. So I think um, we, we can now really go ahead and make these, these fantastic advances and pioneer on Parkinson's disease. And so um, th this is just a quick overview of, of what we um, what we think we, we want to build. So typically, diseases like Parkinson's disease, they start with small mutations in molecules. And these small mutations in, in, in molecules, they propagate through uh, the cell signaling networks and essentially cause havoc in the cell. And then we can essentially go ahead and look at skin cell derived um, brain organoids. We take um, skin cells from patients, we derive um, small pieces of brain tissue from these skin cells, and then um, can use the 4D uh, lattice light sheet microscope to take you know, live movies of what is actually going wrong when you have individual mutations in individual kinases, but then um, propagate through signaling networks to, to wreak havoc. So this is essentially what, what our team is, this is what we are proposing. And I think Susan, you can you can take it from here and talk deeper about you know how like the molecular uh, the molecular aspects of, of our pipeline. Okay, so we'll go from the mechanistic to the um, in that in that image. I think you could see the real potential of taking Irene's patients and bridging all the way across to a mechanistic understanding of how these molecules work and importantly, why they go wrong when one residue is changed and, and bridging that and then going to therapeutics is really the theme of, of our whole talk. So the next one is, um, this is my, the first protein kinase structure, that's PKA that was done here at the supercomputer center with all the computing things that they helped with. That was, that's what I'm most famous for, this structure that was solved 30 years ago now. And it's a template for all those kinases. They all look the same. If you draw it in this cartoon way, when they're active, they, they all look the same. So now if we jump forward, um, now this is a, a very recent article that what, what we understand is that these molecules are highly dynamic. They're not like fixed in a crystal structure where it's very rigid. You want it to be rigid so you can capture the, the, the atomic structure, but they're very dynamic molecules. They're moving around, the loops are moving around and it's that dynamics that really makes them be a switch. You switch it on or you switch it off. But there's switches of the cell and adding one phosphate can switch something on and taking it away will switch it off. So it's understanding that whole realm in, in, in the beginning. That's what we wanted to bring to our uh, luck tube. And um, so the next part is showing in the middle now, um, really the most amazing, this forward domain, this is a huge protein kinase and it's got the domains captured with it, which is very unusual. And so you can see how the kinase domain, which is kind of the two orange ones in the middle, it crosstalks to all the other domains there. So something happens in that green domain, that's where a signal starts. And it senses the kinase, the kinase opens and closes. And, it, and, and you can see when you do take that structure and now you begin to look at particular residues and you look at molecular dynamic simulations, again, with a lot of computing, you turn it into a dynamic molecule where you can see this crosstalk, you can capture this crosstalk and those interfaces between those domains, those are new sites for therapeutic intervention that they're disordered in, in the crystal, in the cryo-EM structure. And now we can open up that space for new kinds of therapeutics. Okay. And now we go to, Alexander is gonna explain more about the switches and how this is a whole network in the cell. That's right. So I'm gonna talk about phosphorylation and tell you exactly what that is. Uh, cells constantly are communicating with one another and they're responding to hormones and neurotransmitters. I gave you the example of histamine and you showed that I showed you caused all these little changes in calcium. So the language that cells use to communicate is phosphorylation. And basically what that is, is attaching a tag onto proteins. So that's that red circle with a P in it. So it's a very, it's a, a molecule of phosphate that just gets plonked onto something to label it. And when it's labeled this way, it's a switch that turns it on or off or changes its ability to bind something else. So it regulates its function. 
And what adds that phosphate are these kinases. They kind of write this language. But that phosphate needs to come up. When you close your eyes, you stop seeing all of a sudden. And that's because this phosphorylation language has been reversed. And so there are these other molecules called phosphatases, which take off that tag. So we'll refer to them as erasers. Well, the Parkinson's disease signaling network is made up of all these players that are putting phosphate on and taking it off again. And the major kinase in this pathway is LARC2, shown as that red circle in the middle of this uh, scheme right here. And you've heard about how it is deregulated in Parkinson's disease. If one little tiny thing can go wrong, it has altered activity and it messes up this entire network. Well, there are also the phosphatases shown in blue that erase that code. We can go to the next slide. I'm going to give you an example of the enzyme, the kinase that I've been working on for the last 30 years, my entire career. And for those of you who live in the La Jolla, Del Mar area, if you ever see a car zipping around with a license plate that says kinase C, you will know who that owner of the car is. Although I have to say it's been parked in my garage for the last 14 months. Anyhow, protein C is an example of an enzyme whose activity has to be exquisitely controlled. And if it's writing a little too quickly, you end up with diseases like Alzheimer's disease and cerebellar ataxia, so neurodegenerative diseases. And if it's not writing fast enough, it's a little too slow, you end up with survival diseases such as cancer. And in the next slide, I'm going to give you what I think is one of the most spectacular examples of what happens when it goes wrong. We identified patients that have Alzheimer's disease in which their protein kinase C molecules were, something was a little wrong with them. So if you can think of a protein as containing all these little components like beads in a necklace. So there are, these are amino acids. So protein kinase C has about 800 beads. One of those beads is a little too small. So it goes from a methionine to a valine, so tiny, tiny, but smaller. So that changes the kinase, the molecule, so that its activity is 30% faster. Now, 30% faster is not a big deal. It would be like you driving, instead of 55 miles an hour, you'd be going 70 miles an hour. So maybe that would be a big deal because you get a ticket. But it doesn't really seem like a, a big change in activity. Yet it changes the phosphorylation pattern in the brain and ultimately, it causes cognitive decline in a mouse model. So on the right-hand side, you can see a mouse who's been given a piece of cotton wool, and they don't do anything with it. They kind of ignore it. But the normal mouse that's got the normal protein high C in it, you give it that piece of cotton wool, and it quickly builds itself a nice little nest. So really amazing that a couple of atoms difference are able to cause this behavioral change. Well, this study, as amazing as it is, Took a very long time to do. We had to make the mouse model, do all the behavioral studies. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a way that we could actually directly look at tissue from patients that have this disease, figure out what the genetic defect is and develop drugs instantly without having to develop these long mouse models. So that's where Johannes comes in with his 4D biology and the organoids. Yes, exactly. I, I think it's really exciting. We can essentially build um, new readouts and faster readouts to make this drug discovery pipeline um, and run faster. And so um, the way the way we could do this is, for example, um, we can, when we look at Parkinson's disease, then in the signaling network, there's like two Parkin, pink one, flip, uh, synuclein, and all of these molecules are intrinsically related to mitochondria. So it, you can actually think of um, Parkinson's disease as, as essentially being a, a, a mitochondrial disease. And when you look at um, mitochondria, how they look like in, in healthy cells, then they essentially form this like long filamentous network. When you look at mitochondria in a mutated Parkinson's disease um, um, molecules, then all of these mitochondria essentially uh, are disrupted in, in one or the other way. They form like these small little um, mitochondria filaments and these like uh, longer uh, essentially disrupted structures. But when you when you look at those structures, what is really required is actually a quantitative readout. So what I'm trying to say here is we, we actually have a readout for Parkinson's disease and it could be uh, these mitochondria phenotypes, how mitochondrial networks are really disrupted in Parkinson's disease. The problem is we really didn't have 
we didn't have a way to to access this information until now um, with the 4D imaging with the new microscopes and the new microscope that I'm developing. Um, so because when you when you look at how mitochondria has have been imaged typically, um, you have to essentially like grow a cell on a glass cover slip. So that's by itself not not necessarily, you know, none of our cells are growing on a glass cover slip. We essentially like growing, like all our cells are growing in an embedded three-dimensional tissue environment. So that's that's introducing an artifact. And then what is also not really true to the true biology of, of looking at how the cell really looks like is, um, you know, this is like, this sketch is not really what a mitochondria looks like. So this is how a mitochondria is typically depicted in a textbook. But this picture, uh, what I, what I like one of the ones that I showed in the previous slide, this is also not how mitochondria really look like. And, and the reason for that is uh, mitochondria actually look like this. Um, the mitochondria form this incredibly intricate and dynamic three-dimensional network throughout the cell. So what we're looking at here is everything that is white is a mitochondrion. And we are essentially looking at a three-dimensional movie of mitochondria moving inside cells over time. And so the reason, the reason that actually, like one of the reasons that happens, mitochondria provide um, the cellular energy. They're essentially the power plants for the cell. And if the cell needs energy here, then it is, it is essentially delivering a mitochondrion closer to that side where, where energy is, is needed. And then if, if the cell needs energy somewhere else, then it takes the mitochondrion away, puts it somewhere else. And then these mitochondria, they, they are using the power, they get damaged in the process, so they have to be um, taken again and have to be recycled, redistributed. So what I'm saying is mitochondria, you, you cannot really capture what is going on in mitochondria when you take just two-dimensional snapshots. You need to have the 3D structure and you need to have the 3D structure over time. So you need um, four-dimensional movies. And if you can, you want to have those four-dimensional movies in tissue rather than having them like of, of cells that have been grown on glass and you have potentially like introduced a couple of artifacts that way. So this has not really been possible before. Now it's possible because we have these adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscopes. We're going to show a couple more movies um, later about this, but to, to quickly go into um, what, what we are talking about here. So confocal is are the microscopes that are typically available um, at research institutions. Then the next iterations would be Gaussian light sheets, then Bessel beam lattice light sheets, and then the, the latest iteration is an adaptive optics lattice light sheet microscope. And it's, it has the size of a car, so it's, it's really big. Um, you have to source the parts from all over the world. We have our cameras from Japan, we have our AOTF from France, and then you have to assemble it yourself. You cannot go ahead and like build, like buy it off the shelf somewhere. Um, we are building it from scratch, from parts, uh, based on a design, uh, uh, from the Betzik laboratory uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, it's 100 times faster than, than the next best uh, uh, technology. It's 100 times less photo bleaching and it has these adaptive optics that make all of this possible. And so the adaptive optics is really the, the game-changing technology here. It almost works like these Bose noise-canceling headphones that you can buy in the Apple Store. Okay, so when you, when you have these Bose noise, noise cancelling headphones, what they do, they, they measure ambient noise and they essentially make anti-noise, overlay anti-noise with your music and then you essentially don't, like the noise and the anti-noise, they cancel each other out and you can only listen to the music. We do the same thing with optics and with microscopy. Because, you know, when you, when you look at, like when you want to image my hand, for example, and my, my hand is quite opaque. You can't really look through my hand. What we can do though, is we can measure how my, how my hand is scattering the light, how, how it essentially like is diffusing the light everywhere. And with a system that's called adaptive optics. So this is essentially like when you look at light rays, they go into a tissue and then get scrambled in the tissue. We have this adaptive optics system that allows you to measure exactly how the tissue is scrambling the light. And we can calculate the inverse of how the tissue is scrambling the light, put that on a deformable mirror, 
And then the, the uh, aberrated light from the sample plus the inverse aberrations on the polymer mirror, they cancel each other and you get perfectly corrected waveforms. So the bottom line is, if you take a normal microscope and you look at tissue, you get blurry images. When you take the new microscope with adaptive optics, you get very, very sharp images. And so now what, we, what that allows us to do is we can take these skin cell derived um, brain organelles. We can you know, culture them in, in dishes. So this is essentially like uh, day seven, uh, day eight of cortical reset formation. This is like, these are the very, very earliest steps of um, you know, brain formation. We can essentially um, grow these little pieces of brain tissue in a dish. And then once we have them in a dish, we can go ahead and image them live in three dimensions. And so um, this is essentially me, um, you know, in the lab, we have uh, essentially grown these, these brain organelles as, as model systems um, for new degenerative disease, for example, for Parkinson's disease. And then you have these three dimensional tissues not grown on glass or anything where you can um, image the dynamics live. And then we can take those live pieces of tissue and take movies at super high resolution um, with these adaptive optics lattice lighting microscopes. So now what we're looking at here is um, we have essentially taken a, a block of tissue, a block of brain tissue. That's, that's essentially our block of brain tissue here. And um, what you're looking at in uh, green is the cell membrane. So those are like the, the outsides of the cell. In, uh, in purple, this is the endoplasmic reticulum, the subcellular structure. And what we have in uh, blue is mitochondria. So those are the, the ones that we want to observe. So for this entire block of tissue, we have essentially uh, captured a three-dimensional movie. So what we can do is we can essentially go into the tissue, zoom into each of these cells of interest that, for example, have Parkinson's disease mutations where we want to like, see what's, what's going wrong. And then we can um, you know, watch the movie, play the movie, and collect data in real time of these cells in live tissue and in live tissue that has been um, you know, non-invasively um, derived from patient-derived uh, stem cells. And so this is just, you know, we are combining a fantastic model system um, with this new four-dimensional imaging technique um, with um, the insights of essentially molecular changes and cell signaling uh, with this wonderful research. And so just one, one last, so this, this all looks fantastic. <laughs> one of the big problems is when you actually image a, a, a block of live tissue at subcellular resolution of like 200 nanometers resolution, um, and you image that every second, like this, this entire 3D volume of tissue, then you create a lot of data like a lot of data. So um, typical microscopes produce like maybe a gigabyte of data per hour. Um, our microscopes, these four dimensional side sheet microscopes have produced uh, three terabytes of data per hour. So just to give you an, a, a, a reference point, the internet speed that we are right now probably using to um, watch the Zoom call, it's like 10 megabit per second. That's typically like the internet speed that we get at home. Um, we have to use data center grade uh, 80 gigabit per second internet speeds. Like it's essentially um, fiber optical cables that power YouTube servers that, that we are plugging in right into our microscopes and send the data directly to the San Diego supercomputer center just to, just to deal with the, with the just amount of data. But this amount of data is fantastic because it really tells us what, what's going on in the cell and what has, what's going wrong in Parkinson's disease so that we can go ahead, understand it and fix it. And so that's, that's essentially what we, are, what we can do, what we're proposing to do and what, we, what we're doing is um, we take these patient-derived um, mini brains, um, use 4D imaging in these mini brains to really figure out what's going wrong um, in cell signaling and in Parkinson's disease, and then uh, use the data that we get for unbiased drug discovery. And um, yeah, this is essentially uh, our vision for curing Parkinson's disease. 
I'm, I'm incredibly excited to be part of this um, phenomenal team. So um, thank you, Susan, for, for having me. Thank you, Alexandra, for having me. Thank you, Irene, for, for that I can be here. And thank you, thank you, Jim, for like that I can be in, in the center and seeing to be center because like the environment is fantastic. And um, yeah, Susan, uh, this is fantastic. I, I give you sort of um, summarize from this. I think you can see how this is an extraordinary opportunity to take Irene's patience take fibroblasts from your skin, make your organoid, do your readout of mitochondrial, any, any neurodegenerative disease is a defect in mitochondria and especially how mitochondria and ER crosstalk, those two red and uh, green and purple things crosstalk. And then you can actually use it to screen for uh, therapeutic things that not just go to the active site of LARC2 or PINK1 and other kinase, but will affect, will correct the mitochondrial defect. So you have an unbiased way of screening. And so I guess I see it as an opportunity for building something really special. You can build um, the, the teamwork, the, uh, the engineering of the microscope and the computational thing. That's a huge infrastructure that we need to have in place so people can query easily this system. But then there's the team of people who make it work. And so Johannes is gonna have, uh, computer science students, biology students, MD, PhD students working together, and they're going to be the bridges who make this all work, who, who really make this, this work. They are people, so we want to build this infrastructure. We want to build like a team of, of Raja Chen scholars who would be then attacking one working on the computational part of it, one working on the microscope part of it. They would talk to each other, and they can also talk to you um, as, as the potential community. And I think that would give you a personal link to what's going on. Not only, you know, your mutation from your skin cell is now in that microscope and you can watch what's doing and what it's doing. And so I think it's a real opportunity to help us build this infrastructure. And, you know, it takes a long time going through NIH. It takes a couple of years to get all this funding. So I think it makes, a, it's a huge opportunity for, for donors to accelerate this process because as, as Johannes said, this is one of the three best microscopes on the planet. He's just gonna be running it for the first time in the next month. And it's amazing. He just came in, in July. And now we have one of the best microscopes on the planet to ask these questions. And we wanna use it to understand Parkinson's disease. Fantastic. Thank you, Susan, Joe, and Alexandra. Very kind and fantastic presentation on, of some of the really exciting work that's taking place here. So we're gonna open it up for the Q&A. And I think one of the first questions that comes up is regarding the idea of personalized medicine. So when one viewer asks, what does personalized medicine mean? And how, give me an example of how you'll be able to personalize uh, treatment for me. And I think it's very interesting, you know, Susan touched on it a bit that, that this linkage between our clinicians identifying individuals, understanding their underlying genetic background, and then being able to explore their biology in these very, very, very detailed manners is, is, is a remarkable opportunity at UCSD. But can you expand upon its so could, link to I personalized say, medicine? You know, in terms of, so there are four very common mutations in Parkinson's disease. Uh, two are in the kinase domain, two are in the, uh, the uh, other domain. And they drive, we, that's, they give you the same phenotype. They give you dysfunctional mitochondria. But you can take that one single mutation from your, the patient with that disease and make the organoid and see how it works. So that's personalized medicine. You may want one drug for that patient who has a mutation in the kinase domain, but you want, may want another drug for a person who has a mutation in the GTPS domain. The GTPS domain makes it come apart. Um, the kinase domain makes it go off and on, the kinase go off and on. So you would have a different drug. You could have a different drug for one mutation versus another. That's what personalized medicine is. How do you, how do you translate your specific mutation into a biological phenomenon that we can then address pharmacologically. Let me, let me, actually, let me actually add on to that uh, also. So I talked about that, that bead of necklaces. There might be like 800 beads or a thousand beads there. Personalized medicine is we find out which bead is off. And you might be the only person that's got that mutation. It doesn't matter. We can figure out why that off bead um, is causing the disease. And then we can use this 4D biology to, to screen for drugs that will work specifically on what you have gone wrong. Great. 
Fantastic. So linked to that, do you, do you expect to find there will be different types of Parkinson's disease as you dig in further? Yes, there are different people that have different presentations of Parkinson's. Some people may have tremors, the other ones may have problems walking, etc. So as they present in different ways with different symptoms, it is also likely that each person may have its own um, problem. And so this technique, what is going to help is identify the real problem and try to search for the proper medication that can help to improve that problem. Yes, which cell is affected and, you know, probably a common thing is this mitochondrial dysfunction, but you can get there different roots in different cells. And so you really have to look um, very specifically at what's happening in each of these. It's like cancer. Cancer is a lot of diseases and different cell types. So um, Parkinson's disease is going to be caused by different things. And yes, then you figure out what's, what's the major phenotype of, of that particular patient. And then you could address it different ways. It's not one common theme. Right. And uh, related to that, then do you think that this technology or approach may be able to develop therapeutics for atypical Parkinson's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on uh, what you're focusing on. At this point, uh, the team is focusing on Parkinson's disease, but at later stage may be interested in focusing on the typical Parkinsonian disorders. And they have different proteins that are involved, like tau instead of alpha synuclein. So it's different uh, what they're searching for. Great. And then what about being able to understand how Parkinson's develops? Will you be able to tell us what causes Parkinson's disease? Finding biomarkers that are early indicators of Parkinson's disease is a really important thing to do. And um, hopefully that will come from, from these kinds of studies. And, and just going back to the last thing, like the atypical, the Alzheimer's disease mutation that Alexander talked about, that's a rare mutation. But it may be that if it's a rare one, there may be a, a specific cure for that one. And so um, it's, it's, you know, it just gives you different mechanisms to get to the same route. And it may be, even though it's a rare one, you may have a specific way to approach that and treat it rather than a pan uh, therapeutic that's gonna work for everything. You know, I found it very interesting, the linkage to mitochondria, which seemed to be a co final common pathway in many diseases of aging right. and the energy pathway that, you know, even if you have the worst mutation, it's still not going to affect you until your 40s or 50s and such. So it seems like these mitochondria kind of gradually get less and less effective as uh, energy substations of the of the body, and that may be the linkage to uh, aging. Do you have any thoughts on that? Maybe it may be um, less functional, but what you also have to do, mitochondria work really, really hard and they turn over. You have to get rid of the bad ones. And so it can be like like Sam is talking about transport. Get, you have to get rid of the bad ones and you give it to other cells and they chew it up and make energy and use it. But if you can't get rid of the garbage, then you, then you get stuck and you get these things. So that's, I think, another part of the mitochondria. But Mitochondria is the central thing. And it, great, and it, it nicely brings up the linkage to some other recent recruits that we've made that are, uh, that are really focusing on a, a very detailed measurement of my, mitochondrial function. And again, just seeing the kind of uh, natural cross-fertilization that takes place at a place like UC San Diego, where folks that are, you know, may not have thought of Parkinson's disease, they were interested in mitochondrial function, now start to see, oh my gosh, this is quite relevant to a disease that's taking place here. And they link up with their partners and, and uh, start collaborations. I think for Joe, this is going to be a really great environment for uh, just making those linkages, almost like those little network figures that Alexandra showed. <laughs> that's almost the a microcosm of what our, our clinicians and our scientists experience. It's kind of one of the reasons we wanted 
Joe, to come here and not just to come here and be like in the middle of the engineering and computing people, but to be in the middle of the biology community, be in the middle of the neuroscience community. And so his microscope being in the middle of your building is where that's where all the neuroscience, that's the center <laughs> of neuroscience. And so it's so exciting. And to have uh, Lauren Luger coming over from the Howard Hughes Medical Investigator site and and uh, it's just really going to be a vibrant environment uh, it, as it continues to be. So I'm going to get back to a couple of these questions. So um, a, a couple of folks saying, when do you think we might be able to put such a thing into place uh, for us? Uh, will you have to run clinical trials before this technology becomes mainstream? Uh, when can we start seeing this technology in use for disease treatment? And, uh, and questions of, of that sort. Yeah, so, so we, are, we are among just a handful of sites where this technology is even being built and, and you need lots of expertise and, and, and technology to actually make it work and have this, have this network of supporters that we have at UCSD uniquely to make it work. Um, but at the same time, the, the capability is is so so powerful. Um, we need to get it into into more people's hands. And so one of the, one of the one of the ideas really is, you know, I'm, I'm building a prototype like like one microscope here, and then we're gonna um, build a second one, um, open it up to the campus community to have have more people come use it, um, because I, I think we have to really like move away from imaging cells on glass cover slips in two dimensions and actually like move into taking three-dimensional movies in tissues because th that is really how how all our cells operate and we might make or like we, we might have already made mistakes and and how we think cells work by only being confined to cells that are that are living on glass cover slips and, and imaging them in two dimensions so i think as, and yeah, I think, you know, also like when we talked about atypical Parkinson's disease, it's, it's a microscope, you know, we can use it, you know, for, for many different applications. And this is a technology that we, we have to develop and get into more people's hands as quickly as we can. Excellent. But you'll start doing now the microscope's almost done. The first, this first year, you will make organoids from patients with Parkinson's disease yep. mutations, and you will look at their mitochondria. That'll be done with this year. You'll have a spectrum of maybe yeah. Uh, half a dozen different Parkinson's disease mutations. What do the mitochondria look like? Developing the drugs, doing the drug screening, and then when you find a drug, doing the chemical, the trials and everything like that, that takes a long time. But doing this mechanistic understanding, can using the mitochondria as a readout, that's going to be done as soon as your microscope, it's going to oh, yeah, be the first experiment. Yeah, absolutely right. Like So, so the, the movie of a, of a brain organoid that I showed, that, that has been done in, in the lab. So that, that's essentially brain organoids that, have, that are growing like a couple, a couple of meters from here. And the microscope is gonna be ready, um, yeah, literally in a couple of weeks. And then, and then we're gonna like collect data. Um, so yeah, no, we, we, are, we are on this and we are, like, it's exciting, it's, it's happening. So one oh. of the questions, oh, go ahead, Irene. No, I was gonna say that uh, knowing what the problem is, knowing uh, the structure, we can design drugs, medications that could help. Uh, they may be in the market, they may not be. So that needs to be seen. So that takes some time. And we don't know how long that would be because, you know, there are different steps. Uh, but the certain thing is that we'll be in the path to get to the proper treatments. Right. And so that relates to one of the questions of an attendee. So do you expect this will become the common path for treatment? I think I can adapt that a little bit. I think the pathway of understanding uh, how a drug makes effect is definitely going to rely on technologies like this. And that's the beauty of science as it continues to advance, where drug development is benefiting from these very basic science innovations, physics. I mean, basically, Joe came from a physics world and now is really making a major impact on Parkinson's disease and its drug therapy and its therapeutic development. I, I think that's the truly exciting piece of being at a medical center 
that includes more than just a hospital. It includes an entire linkage to a broad and diverse campus, including engineering and school of pharmacy and school of public health and uh, other partner institutions that are here. Uh, so I do believe it'll become the final pathway toward uh, very much rapidly developing new therapies and, and places like this are gonna be leading the way. So I'm thinking from this discussion, Irene, you should give us all your mutations, all your Parkinson's disease mutations, especially those related to LARC2, but maybe we can classify them into probably a lot of people have the G2019S, that's a common one, but maybe there's some uncommon ones in there that would be have mechanistic insight for us. So if we had that set, what are the, the Parkinson mutations, LARC2 mutations in your pool of patients who are here, we could classify those and then you know, give feedback to this, this is your mutation and these are the effects, you could do that. You could really do that. And sometimes there's just one mutation that really gives you insight that could have broad applications. But that one, I view these mutations as kind of a treasure chest. And normally these processes are much too fast to see. You can't ever trap it and look at it, but you get a single mutation and it gets stuck, it gets jammed. And that allows you, like it allowed um, uh, uh, Andreas to look at that structure, it gets stuck. And now you can look at it. You can look at something that's um, otherwise too dynamic to see. So that's right. a treasure chest. Your mutations are a treasure chest for us. We are delighted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is fantastic. And I think this is where the, a department like neurosciences, which has the scientists, the basic scientists, looking at the molecular pathways, linking right next to the clinicians who where they can work hand in hand because the clinician is really phenotyping the patient, <laughs> understanding the underlying genetics. And now with the iPSCs, the induced pluripotent stem cell, where the skin biopsy now turns this individual's tissue with their genetic background and everything personal about them into a model, into the dish, that is going to be the future. I'm so excited about it in Alzheimer's disease. And of course, it's going to be very exciting in Parkinson's disease. We have a wonderful question here say, how can we, as people with Parkinson's, help this hugely exciting research? Do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, certainly we've always talked about the participation in research as being the heroes of our development of new therapies. Uh, they're, they're giving their uh, either their time or their comfort or sometimes giving their treasure in very generous philanthropic donations to our programs. And uh, I think there are many opportunities for us, but uh, maybe you can highlight that, Irene. How can people with Parkinson's help this research? Well, I think you said it all. I think that participation in research is a major thing. Donating, for example, the PD gene allows you to have free uh, test to see what is the mutations that you may have. And then we can have that as a part of uh, what uh, uh, Susan's group can do and work on. The other thing is uh, donations, of course, that also helps. And even um, trying to uh, re you know, help that research could be done um, within the NINDS and open up a uh, path within um, the community so more scientific uh, research can be funded. So there are multiple, multiple ways. Fantastic. Please join us tomorrow for an extraordinarily extraordinary program called Creating New Neurons, the Potential to Reverse Parkinson's Disease. Please sign up if you haven't, there's still time, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks again for joining us.